Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Rick Ferguson. I'm the co-founder and artistic director of the Musical Offering, and it's lovely to see live people in a room where we're playing music for each other, so that's great. Uh, this, this Bach Festival is actually a student-focused event that we've been doing for some number of years, and uh, I, I believe two years before the pandemic, we actually added a faculty recital to go with. So for instance, tomorrow we'll have uh, students, I think we'll have uh, four recitals going on for our students who will come and play. And that's just a whole lot of fun. And uh, it's even better to have the faculty involved as well. Um, you know, one little thing I will say to, to preface the program as a whole, you know, it's, it's really this music from the early to mid 18th century uh, that formed a lot of the foundation of all music that has happened, uh, certainly in the European tradition since that time. And so in one way or another, regardless of style, uh, all roads tend to sort of lead back to this specific period in time. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about Bach, but first I think we should hear some handles. So let's welcome Michelle.
it was, was an extremely uh, artistically chaotic period because you have the, uh, the infusion of age of enlightenment, philosophical, scientific, musical, artistic uh, thinking coming into play at this time. And I think no example really sort of serves better to illustrate this time period than actually a, a meeting that happened in 1747 in Berlin when, uh, when Johann Sebastian Bach was invited to visit his son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, who was the court composer uh, for Frederick the Great. Uh, Frederick the Great at this time, in, in addition to being an absolute flute maniac, was, uh, was really very much in the forefront of Age of Enlightenment thinking, right? So I have this nifty little book, which uh, I would highly recommend. It's called uh, Evening in the Palace of Reason. And it's exploring this specific time period using this meeting between Johann Sebastian and, uh, and King Frederick as sort of the, the, uh, the main example for the cultural transition that was going on at this time. So I'm going to read a paragraph so that you have a little sense. And then we're going to hear some Bach. Uh, to provide a little context. Johann Sebastian Bach was 62 years old in 1747, only three years from his death. And making the long trip from Leipzig, uh, which would be his last journey, was surely more a concession than a wish. An emphatically self-directed, even stubborn man, Bach took a dim view of this particular king, the Prussian army having overrun Leipzig less than two years before. And at his advanced age, he could not have relished spending two days and a night being jostled about in a coach to meet the bitter enemy of his own royal patron, the Elector of Saxony. Even more problematic than the political and physical difficulties of such a journey, though, the meeting represented something of a confrontation for the aging composer, a confrontation, one might say, with his age. In music, in virtually every other sphere of life in mid-18th century Germany, Frederick represented all that was new and fashionable while Bach's music had come to stand for everything ancient and outmoded. His musical language, teaching, and tradition had been rejected and denounced by young composers and theorists, even by his own sons. And Bach had every reason to fear that he and his music were to be forgotten entirely after his death, had indeed been all but forgotten already, uh, which we'll get to tell him on at, at the end of the program. For this reason and others, his encounter with, the Prussia, with Prussia's young king threatened to bring into question some of the most important qualities by which he defined himself as a musician and as a man. It would also present him the opportunity for one of the most powerful and eloquent assertions of principle he'd ever made. But that would have been anything but clear to him at the time. And what this refers to is the composition of a set of pieces that Bach wrote as a result of this journey entitled The Musical Offering. And so that is where The Musical Offering gets its name and very much its identity because of the transformational, uh, this transformational period and the fact that, that we really feel that uh, we can do our, our bit as a community music school to be somewhat transformational in our community. So with that being said, let's welcome Ryan.
that was lovely. Um, more than anything, perhaps, uh, you know, being as multi-talented as, as Johann Sebastian was, he was known far and wide as an improviser, especially at the, uh, at the organ, where he spent so much of his life, uh, sort of professional and personal. Um, and here we have a wonderful example of uh, something of an homage uh, to Bach's prowess at the organ, uh, Ferruccio Busoni, uh, late 18th, early 19th, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, Italian pianist, amazing pianist, very interesting composer, interesting thinker, and uh, really had a wonderful knack for creating the most beautiful transcriptions of, of pieces, many for the organ, uh, for the piano. And so here, John is going to share this chorale prelude with us, and it's just a wonderful example of the universality of Bach's music, because you know you can hear Bach essentially played on any instrument, uh, whether it was really written for that instrument or not, and it sounds so convincing, and uh, it, it sounds just absolutely uh, uh, transcendent, regardless of whatever it's being played on. So let's welcome John.
not. Uh, flute viola da gamba, uh, viola d'amore, I think it was originally written for. Uh, and, and Willie has found this piece, and we've had such a good time playing this piece. In 1740, if you'd been in a, like a, one of the major German metropolitan areas, and if you ask anybody who knew anything about music whatsoever of the time, well, who's your favorite composer? Uh, most of the time, the answer would have been Telemann. Uh, Telemann was very widely known. Uh, Bach, really, much, much less so. And uh, I think it, it takes the wheel of time and history turning to, uh, to uh, you know, sort of sort out things uh, as they are today. But, uh, you know, Telemann was a fascinating individual. He fully embraced Age of Enlightenment. And in musical terms, really what that meant was that for the listener, the music should be almost immediately accessible and understandable. You should maybe need to hear it once or twice before you get it. Uh, the same for really the performers as well to a great extent, as opposed to, uh, you know, for instance, in the chorale prelude that, that John played, there is Bach's exploration of, of mystery. Um, of that which sort of moves beyond music. Uh, one of the great innovations that actually Telemann uh, uh, was involved in himself was writing music to be played in the home, specifically uh, for, for the home. And uh, at this period of time, we started to have much more in the way of instruments and music making uh, going on in the home. And Telemann was very, very interested and wanted to support that. And so, uh, you know, he's really quite a, uh, an important figure in music history, especially if you're interested at all, as I am in this whole, like, Age of Enlightenment time period. All right, so let's welcome Caroline and Willie. Uh,